Okay, so I want to thank the advance team who made my visit here possible, um, and that's a list of people. Amy Wharton, Greta Leibniz, Alex Tan, Fran McSweeney, Candace Claiborne, Bob Bates, Katie Joshi. Thanks also to Sandy Watson and Diane McGarry, um, who helped set things up and made, every, made sure everything ran smoothly while I was here. So um, I'll talk today about a project, the project for which I was on campus doing interviews, which is um, an NSF-funded study of the transition between associate and full for faculty in the STEM disciplines. Now, the tenure process has actually been studied quite a lot, um, and, we, and to the extent that anything is rational in the academic promotion um, process, tenure is relatively uh, rationalized. There are often at least some standards for tenure, um, and the gap between men and women at the level of tenure is actually very small to non-existent on, on most campuses. Um, the gap between men and women at full is very large, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that for you in just a second. The promotion to full is, of course, a very different thing. It's voluntary. Nobody has to go up for full. You can retire an associate professor. Um, many faculty uh, standards for promotion to full are generally even less clear than those for tenure, and I'll show you that. Um, so institutionally, um, the process is far looser and more ambiguous. Um, I have a little section on why we need women as full professors, but I think I'll skip that. I bet you know. Um, so. Um, uh, so here's, here's what I'll do. I'll give you a little background and context. Um, talk a little bit about gendering through policy. I did an analysis of tenure and promotion documents that I'll, I'll say a little bit about. Um, then I'll say um, something about what we know about barriers to promotion to full for all faculty. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Um, I'll talk about um, gendered barriers in terms of work family, um, which are, of course, really important. Um, and then I'll say something about climates and this notion of gender salience for the sociologists in the room. This comes out of the work of Cecilia Ridgway, who has talked about the salience of gender in in uh, organizational contexts, um, and then say something in terms of preliminary um, implications. So first I'll give you some data, because I'm a sociologist and I love data. Um, this is uh, a table that comes out of Donna Nelson's work. Donna Nelson is in the uh, Department of Chemistry at OU, um, that is Oklahoma University, um, and has been doing these diversity surveys for years on the proportion of faculty by discipline. What you have here in this row, or this column, <laughs> is um, the proportion of women in the PhD pool in particular disciplines from 1996 to 2005. So it's the average, basically, of women in the pool during that period. So this gives you a sense of the reference pool for each discipline. Then what you have in these columns is the proportion, um, actually it's not the proportion, it's the gap between um, the proportion of women at that level and the proportion in the pool. So I, I, I've hidden those intermediate columns where that calculation is happening. So this is the actual gap over here. Um, at the assistant, associate, and full level, and for the discipline as a whole. And um, what you see here in the pink is these are cells where women are underrepresented relative to their position or their proportion in the pool by 15 or more percentage points. The green cells are places where women are overrepresented relative to their proportion in the pool. Um, one of the most striking things you notice immediately is that the most, the, the pinkest discipline of all um, is psychology. Psychology is underrepresented across the board, and the reason is partly that 67.8% of all PhDs in sociology are women, or psychology are women. Um, and, it, and hence it makes sense that you would see this underrepresentation at full and associate, but psych is actually underrepresented by almost 20 points at the assistant level, which doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of what we see in the pool. Sociology is next. Um, we're 60.8% of uh, people in the pool are women. Um, sociology is not underrepresented as assistant much, um, but is at associate and full, and then the discipline as a whole. When we get to the sciences, you see um, that biology is sort of next in the ranking list. Um, 46 point, and, and biology is the science in which you have the most women in the pool, right? So 46.3% of those PhDs in the pool during this period were women. Biology is underrepresented at the associate and full levels um, and in the discipline as a whole. And we usually think of biology as sort of the most woman-friendly of the sciences. Um, you can see a similar representation, or you can see uh, underrepresentation at pretty high levels um, in chemistry and in math. Um, I'll say a little bit about the pipeline explanation in a minute, but if you pay attention, you see that the pipeline actually for women in many of these disciplines um, has improved quite a lot. Uh, women are now 32.4% of those getting PhDs in chemistry. There are about 30% of those getting PhDs in math. So it's no longer the case that there's just one or two women 
Um, in fact, in many of these disciplines, there are quite a number. Now, the overrepresentation you see is, interestingly enough, all in the hard sciences and engineering, basically. Um, so women are the biggest overrepresentation you see is in mechanical, which actually doesn't take much because only 8% of uh, the PhD pool in mechanical is women. But they are, they are overrepresented at the level of assistant and similarly chemical, civil, electrical. My guess, and I don't have the data to support this, but my guess is that this is probably due to the influence of initiatives like Advance, which have really focused on getting more women hired at those assistant professor ranks and starting them through the process. And so um, my guess is that's where this overrepresentation comes from. And you can see it starting to filter in even at the associate level in at least a couple of engineering disciplines. So this is an interesting table, I think, for a lot of reasons. Um, because, first of all, because you can see these patterns. Second, because I think it shows you that not all the issues with underrepresentation are in the STEM disciplines. In fact, it, these issues are, exist in the social sciences as well. She doesn't collect data for the humanities, so I don't have that. Um, so um, I have data for your campus, in case for this campus, in case you were wondering what things are like here. Um, this is the distribution of your faculty in raw numbers on this main campus. Um, and you can see that you have 58 women full professors on the entire campus. Um, it's true that on my campus we have 54, and our faculty is about 40% bigger than your faculty. So um, maybe all of us could get together in a small room, you know, in a small room and have a meeting. Um, you can see the way that you can see that women are. So if you want to look at the issue of representation, there are 35 women are 35% of the faculty, and up to associate. I mean, they're way overrepresented as instructors and lecturers, which you would expect. Um, but at assistant and associate, things are pretty, you, they're where you would expect them to be, given women's proportion in the faculty. Here's where you see the gap, right? So women are only 18% of full professors. Um, this is a statistic I like, though you don't see the data parsed this way very often. This is the percentage of women faculty who are full professors. So it's the chance that if you ran into a woman faculty member on this campus, she'd be a full professor. Um, uh, Debbie likes to gamble. I wouldn't take this bet, right? Um, um, you do, you'd do better guessing that um, any given man you ran into was a full professor. That's 44%. I have the data for STEM faculty. So this is still WSU faculty, but it's just the STEM disciplines. You got 24 women full professors in the STEM disciplines. You, need any, you, you wouldn't even need this whole room. Um, you can see that women are, again, but you see this pattern of representation sort of all the way up to associate and the big drop off at full. Um, women actually do slightly better, but remember there are only 91 of them in the STEM faculty in terms of this number. Um, this is a great bet now. We're at 51% of men um, as full professors. Um, so that gives you a sense of what things are like on this campus. I have another, I love data. I have another table to show you. This one is complicated. But I've been to 10 campuses as part of this work. Seven of them are represented here. And what I have done is I've taken the proportion of women faculty who are full professors and the proportion of men faculty who are full professors. So that thing I was showing you at the bottom of those tables. And this is for every, for seven of the campuses that I've been on. So here's WSU, those numbers that you saw. Here's U of I, 43% for men faculty, 21% for women. Um, you can then sort of see the, see the distribution. But, but the point that you get is that there's a huge gap, right? No matter what campus you're on, there's a very large gap. Those of you who like data have already noticed this one. North Dakota State, where only 6% of women on campus um, were full professors. When I was there doing interviews um, in October, there were nine women full professors on the North Dakota State campus out of a total of 850 faculty. Um, I interviewed every single one of them. I did a census. Um, so um, uh, this year, actually, seven women on that campus came up for promotion to full. And, they, and I think all of them, or maybe all of them, but one got it. Um, and my worry about that as a sociologist of gender and work is that now everybody will think it's easy, like, you know, the, you know it's easy to get because seven women got it at one time and we've sort of, that concerns me. But at any rate, um, this was the most dismal situation I saw in terms of the campuses I was on. But, but none of them are all that out of range, right? Even though they're very different campus contexts, all the way from WSU to KU, which is a flagship institution. Um, so all of them you see these big gaps. Okay. So... What, so what, what kinds of barriers are, are, might we possibly consider that make this gap happen? Um, there is, of course, the pipeline explanation. And when I interview faculty in the sciences, I hear a lot about this. You know, so when I say, which I don't say to all of them, so what's up with this? Explain to me why there's only one woman in your department or why there, which is really common. 
um, they say, well, we just need more women in the pipeline. And, and in fact, many of them are really invested in going into the high schools or the middle schools and trying to get more women into the pipeline. And, and I don't want to undercut those explanations at all, um, or, but I, or undercut those efforts at all, because I think they're important. But I think rhetorically, one of the functions of the pipeline explanation is a, it's a sort of, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. You don't sort of have to do anything. You sort of have to wait for women to get through the pipeline, right? Um, and, and as I say, some people, of course, are trying to do something proactively. But, but ultimately, we know from studies of the pipeline that women are just more likely to leak out of it at every stage. Um, and so the pipeline, while it may be a piece of the puzzle, is not all of it. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the promotion of full is that it's voluntary. It's not on a time clock. So there's no sense that you have to give anyone full professor, right? Um, it's, it's a prize. It's an honor. It's something that's extra that no one needs to have. People retire as associate professor all the time. And I actually think this creates some gendered barriers that if I have time, um, I'll talk about. Tenure and promotion policies are vague, and I'll give you some evidence of that. Um, um, to preview a little bit, in, in what Ridgway argues is that in any case in which the, the policies regarding, in this case, tenure and promotion are vague, gender takes on, gender can take on far more salience, right? Because there is no sense of what the standards are, what the objective standards are, and we'll talk about that. Work-family uh, issues matter, and I'll say uh, a little bit about those. I think they matter for both men and women. Whoever does the care work suffers, um, but ultimately women do far more of the care work. Um, and then finally, I'll talk uh, in this talk a little bit about gendered cultures and departments. Um, so let's see, where do I want to go? Um, so the project on which I'm reporting here is centrally focused on understanding the importance of these factors and others um, in understanding the promotion to full. So here's what the project is. Um, originally, it was supposed to be an interview study of 80 men and women STEM faculty at seven universities. And this is how the sample is stratified. So, we did associate in rank three to six, because these would be people who would be thinking about promotion to full, presumably. Associate in rank seven plus. Um, so I, we started out calling this stuck associates, and I've come to really hate that terminology over time. But that's, how we, that's what we started out calling it. Um, promotion to, we, and then we had um, full professors promoted within six or fewer, or promoted within seven or more. Now, if I was on a campus in which the normative times were different, I, I'm, I messed with that a little. So if I was on a campus in which seven years was the common time, then I adjusted it according to the, to sort of the norms on that campus. The idea was to have 10 men and 10 women uh, STEM faculty per cell for a total of 80 um, interviews. And, and the original plan was to do this on seven campuses. I also did some document analysis, which I'll tell you about in a second. Um, here's what the sample as of today looks like. And today, I did my last interview in this project. Um, I wound up doing 130 interviews on 10 campuses. Um, the reason was that there were three campuses that sort of added themselves on at their own expense, um, and WSU was one of those, because this issue of promotion to full has become a really important one for deans and provosts, and as this, as this gap becomes more and, you know, becomes um, more and more visible, I think people are paying more attention to it and, and want to sort of see what's um, impeding the process or facilitating it. You can see um, I interviewed more women than men, but not as many more as you might think, given the topic of the work. Honestly, I generally did not broadcast the fact that it was about gender. I sort of said, you know, this is about barriers to promotion or what facilitates promotion. And so I got 57 men and 73 women. The cells uh, are pretty close to the way we wanted them to come out. You can see um, I'm absolutely even with associates, and then the fulls, full seven plus were hard to find. Um, partly because often the data on particular campuses weren't good. Nobody sort of knew if that was the case. And when I interviewed people, sometimes it was the case that they had been promoted earlier than the data suggested or people thought. Here's my mix. Um, I interviewed more engineers than any other category, 30 of them. Um, and of course, engineers are in colleges of engineering, so I could break this out if, to make it more specific. Next are math people. Um, one of the things I discovered with mathematicians is they are um, disproportionately likely to be coupled in departments. I interviewed in one department that had four married couples and another math department that had three. Um, women mathematicians are married to men mathematicians, apparently, and I think that's because, like, how, who could they talk to? Other, I mean, <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, I'm a popular science geek, and I could have conversations with everyone here except the mathematicians. They would say, this is what I do, and I would go, oh, okay. Um, so 14 biologists, 
Uh, natural resources, um, I've been in a lot of land grants, so these are like fisheries and wildlife, or their forestry, or their, those are the kinds of departments you find there. Um, plant science, these are often college of ag, so, so botany, whatever that might be. Uh, chemistry, animal science, you can then go on down the list. One of the places I went wanted me to interview faculty at their um, College of Liberal Arts, and so there were science folks in there, but I interviewed people in music and English and art, and that was actually sort of cool because it gave me an interesting perspective on the rest, so, and some social science people. So that's what I got. Um, and ultimately, I think there's enough diversity there to allow me to say something, or at least I hope there is. Um, so that's it, as of this morning. All right, so I want to start briefly by giving you a little sense of what I saw in the tenure and promotion documents, and maybe this is just um, um, sort of a, a humor break, um, because, because ultimately I analyzed, I, had, I think I had 12 from my campus. Since then I've acquired more documents, and analyzing tenure and promotion documents is not something you want to do late at night when you're sleepy. Um, they're, they're not entertaining things to read. Um, but ultimately, I did analyze them and, and sort of did a, a, the usual thing in terms of qualitative analysis. So um, let's, let me show you some things in the tenure and promotion documents. The most common pattern I, I would describe is, uh, kindly, is omission and obfuscation. This is my very favorite of the documents. Um, in this document, it says, for promotion to full professor, distinguished representation in discipline, they made me blind them, um, such that he or she would be invited to join our faculty at the rank of full professor. So you're a faculty member facing this particular set of standards. I'm not sure ultimately how anything could be more circular than this particular definition of what it takes to be a full professor. Now I will, this department did revise its document. Um, and so this, is, this was an original document. Uh, actually this department had a woman chair who made it her mission to revise the document. Um, and I'll say something about why this is problematic in a second. Um, the more usual pattern is one of making requirements deliberately unclear, so here's a nice example. Um, no exact quotas or guidelines can exist, and a combination of objective and subjective elements will enter into a final decision. Decisions on acceptable performance levels must contain the individual judgments of the faculty and the administrators involved in the decision, right? Again, there's sort of nothing, this is jello, right? There's sort of nothing you can nail down here in terms of um, and when I talk to people, sort of, and, and I'm not in favor of sort of, you know, running universities on a business model, but when I talk to people in the business world, they look at things like this and say, are you kidding me? This is, em this is employment policy? Um, and in fact, it is, right? Um, other, uh, I have other examples. I think I'll just show you one more. Um, I like this one. Promotion to professor is based on the attainment of sustained excellence in the assigned responsibilities of the faculty member and recognition of excellence by all appropriate constituencies. <laughs> so you must be excellent and people must recognize it. Um, it reminds me of an episode of MASH in which they talked about military jargon and how you write a, you know, so you must be excellent, you must be outstanding in your field. Um, so again, um, you see the pattern. The most common thing that you find in these documents is um, a requirement for national and international reputation and leadership. Um, so here, for example, expectations for promotion from associate professor to professor are higher um, and include leadership uh, in scholarly research and strong professional recognition at the national and international levels. Um, one of the things that's been interesting to me as I've done this work is that people give me things, particularly people who are, have had difficult tenure or promotion battles. So I've acquired all of these files. Um, and one of the things that you find is that leadership is one of the most malleable words in these documents. Um, because what, how do we know if you're a leader in research? I mean, I interviewed a woman who had $9.1 million in grants, but her department had turned her down because the argument was that she was not a leader in that research, right? She wasn't in the right sort of position. Um, and she had four patents and three teaching awards and it was a, it was a really toxic department. Let's just leave it at that. But, but ultimately it was the word leadership that was hanging her up. And this notion of, of recognition and impact um, it gets parsed very differently in different departments. Like what does that mean? Have you been invited to speak somewhere? Where's your work being published? Who's reading it? How often is it being cited, et cetera? So you see that uh, a lot in these cases. Um, so why, why do vague, ultimately why do vague standards matter? Um, vague standards matter, I think, because they make the informal culture very important. If you don't have something written down, you need to find somebody to tell you what the story is. So what do I really need, right? And if you're very isolated in a department, that becomes more difficult. And this is one of the things that mentoring programs try to deal with very centrally, right, is how to help people navigate the informal culture. Um, they allow a wide range of subjectivity, which I've seen in these many files that I have acquired. 
Um, and they also, and some people will tell you this is why they're written this way, um, they make recourse nearly impossible. And as I have interviewed administrators and faculty at various levels, one of the things I have found is that administrators really want clarity in tenure and promotion documents because they want to be able to hold departments to their own standards, right? Um, associate professors really want transparency in their tenure and promotion documents because they want to know what it takes, but senior faculty and department heads do not want it at any level, right? And, and the argument is often that we want to maintain flexibility. And I've also heard, um, well, we want to be able to protect people. So if somebody is not in the, in the right situation, and, and I think ultimately with all good intentions, but it is the case that people who are being protected by the documents often don't feel particularly protected by the vagueness in the documents. So here's a woman whose case captures this, I think. Um, she says, I asked her what makes the barrier to promotion to full a harder one for woman, women. She says, well, the documents aren't that transparent. If there were specific guidelines, like a checklist, and I'll let you read this. Um, but without that, you don't have a clue where you are. If we could push for that, I think it would be easier for females to go for promotion. And I asked her, so why women disproportionately? And she said, well, because I think men talk to each other and they support each other more. And we don't have that. Um, I'm the only female in the department. So gender matters. In this case, gender really matters. And um, this woman's experience actually captures the problem with vague standards. She was in a, a department in which there were three men, full professors. Um, one of them was her former department chair, whom she and another faculty member had accused of, of, of sexual harassment. Um, he was ultimately removed as department head, but he had an ally. Um, and so whenever she came up for promotion to full, and she had come up twice, the vote was two to one against her. Um, and because she did, um, and, and so she really felt like she didn't have any recourse because she would look at the standards which were sort of non-existent and not be able to explain why she should be promoted to full. One of the other things that happens when there are no standards is that people use this sort of reference case model. So you can point to whoever came up before you, right? So somebody just came up and this is what they had. Um, the problem with that is the promotion to full is rare. Um, often there will be several years between promotions to full, and as you all know, the bar is rising all the time, right? So you can't turn to somebody who was promoted even 10 years ago and say, but I did what they did, right? Because nobody will accept that as a reasonable justification for becoming full professor. So um, her case captures it. Her tragic, very tragic case happens, it captures it nicely. I actually talked to one woman not this woman who was in a similar situation, um, who said, uh, who was told that the hearse would have to solve her problem. Um, so, at any rate, yeah. All right, so now the issue, I'm a sociologist and I love policy. I think you can change policy way faster than you can change people. I like it a lot. Um, but I think transparent policies are not a panacea. Um, of course, a motivated individual or a motivated committee can always pull a policy apart, right? Um, this woman says, faculty are very good at the post hoc hypothesis. So they decide if they like you or not. If they like you, they dig for the things they like and say those are the reasons you should be promoted. If they don't like you, they'll find those other things um, and sort of justify their decisions. Um, this other woman does it in a more succinct way. Policies don't protect people unless you have a person willing to go to bat in the room. Policies are worthless. I've seen people get screwed with rules, rules interpreted by morons. <laughs> <coughs> um, so, so this woman captures the double-edged nature of policies, right? They're never enough without a culture and a structure that supports their equitable use, right? Um, but I think, and I think there are structural ways to make that happen, and I'll say a little bit about that in my conclusion. So I love that woman. You'll be hearing more from her. Um, so, so barriers for all faculty, um, and, and I think I've been able to identify those pretty clearly over these 130 interviews. Junior administrative roles, any role, any position with assistant associate or vice in the title, um, anything with director if that position has no resources, department chair, um, all of those things are things that hold up all faculty members because you don't get credit for administrative work. Um, and, and by the way, those things are happening more and more as budgets get cut, and people are looking for interim chairs or interim heads um, who are, who, you know, sometimes an associate professor is the only person who can take that job. Um, other service matters, and we always tell our assistant professors, don't do any service. No matter what people ask you, don't do any service. 
Um, and I think, I think that's generally good advice, but I think it's sometimes double-edged because if you get faculty who are extremely isolated in departments, so for example, African-American faculty um, who feel isolated by their colleagues, one of the ways that they can find meaning in their work often is to connect with students, right? They, they want to connect with communities of students um, and that helps them feel less isolated, right? And so I think, uh, I think it's double-edged, right? And ultimately, it's, it's difficult to say no one should do it. Right? And of course, countable service, right? When I ask people, so what kind of service counts, it's never student related service, right? It's always service in your discipline to your national organization or whatever. Heavy teaching responsibilities matter for everybody. Um, or choices to focus on pedagogy. I'm, I've interviewed faculty in departments that had very large NSF grants, for example, on science education or engineering education or math education, whatever that might be. And, and those people all say, don't do it. You shouldn't do it as an associate professor because it will not count. Um, even when those grants are sometimes the largest research expenditures in their department or the second largest, um, ultimately those are, are, will hurt your career. I actually interviewed an associate professor who got a GK-12 grant just sort of immediately, which is a one, you know, one and a half million dollars, and struggled to get it counted for the next few years of her career. Um, health issues matter for everybody. And we'll talk about, I, I, I'll talk about that a little bit in terms of work and family. Non-standard academic appointments matter for everybody. Um, if, you, if you don't have the template appointment, whatever that is on your campus, be it, you know, 60% research, 40% teaching, 10%, yeah, that's 110%, but that's about right, right? Um, whatever that is, that matters. Um, and it matters particularly once files get out of a department, but it matters too in departments. I've been on a lot of um, land-grant campuses, extension faculty, uh, particularly have trouble with this because what extension faculty will tell you is look my extension appointment is just on top of everything else I just do what a regular faculty member would do and then I also do extension because they don't know how to count it ultimately um, so those things matter for everybody so I want to start uh, talking a little bit about gendered barriers however and I'll say I'll start with work family very very briefly one of the things that we know um, is that work family matters for everybody right whoever does the work um, academic women um, with children, however, are more likely to be primary caregivers. There was a study by Marianne Mason, came out a couple of months ago, that found that even in two academic households, the women spend about 20% more hours on um, childcare. Um, and for many, uh, but not all, of the women I've interviewed, fam work family issues have been important. Um, women full professors, and I really want to go back and, and calculate this in my data, but um, my sense at the moment is that the women full professors I've interviewed are disproportionately likely to be primary breadwinners in their families. So um, they, have ma they have men in their, you know, they have husbands who are high school principals or they're nurses or they're research technicians or they're um, ultimately their husband's careers are more flexible than theirs. Um, I have rarely seen academic cases in which the, the, both spouses are full professors. Right, and, and of course, women have been doing this for men for years, right? It's just not visible when they do it because that's what wives do. Um, when men do it, of course, it becomes far more visible and, and many of the women I've talked to really struggle with this and really talk about, you know, it's hard for my husband and, and et cetera. And this is true in the corporate world as well, actually, so it's not surprising. When you look at women CEOs, for example, so it's not surprising we'd see it in the academy. Okay, so in terms of work family, um, many women in STEM disciplines are often the first in their departments or the first or second to come up for promotion of full, certainly. Um, and if they have children, they um, find often very little support. This woman um, has a spouse. She had a spouse with a PhD in a science discipline, but who was never fully accommodated by the university. Um, and she um, experienced, basically, there was no support for her. She says, uh, when I came here, I was the third female faculty member ever in the department third in that group and the first ever to have a child while a faculty member. I asked, you know, how'd that work? Because I'm a brilliant interviewer. Um, <laughs> let, let's just say that I'm a strong promoter of maternity leave policies for faculty. I went right through. I worked until the day or two before she was born because being a new faculty member, I had tried to save as much vacation as I could, which is always hard for young faculty. Um, and I took four weeks of vacation after she was born and then she went into childcare. Um, I have spent a lot of time talking to academic women about how they timed their children. Um, they timed them for Christmas break or they timed them for summer break and if the kids came two weeks early then that created a problem with the plan that had been set up or if they came two weeks late or if they... So there's a lot of energy that goes into the timing of children. And I've interviewed a number of faculty, women faculty members who say, you know, I had my child on a Friday and I was back to teaching my class on a Wednesday. 
Um, and that's extremely common. So this woman actually was a very strong supporter of, there was an advance grant on this campus that actually did not spend much of its resources on work family. And so she had been sort of strongly trying to push them in that direction. Now this woman had been um, objectively successful, um, but she sees her future progress, for example, into administration as being blocked by what she frames as a free choice, because women always framed it this way, to sort of spend time on work and family. She says, um, I've seen opportunities for administrative skills and I've let them go by the wayside, and that was my choice. You can see that language here, because of my daughter. I was on boards of directors for professional organizations. I was on a committee for the National Academy of Sciences, which is no small thing, right? Um, I did a lot of good things, and then I had a daughter who said, Mom, you're gone all the time. Could you stay home more? And she said, okay, I'll stay home. Um, this, and this woman was crying at this point in the interview. I actually interviewed about a dozen women who cried at some point um, during the interviews. I mean, these are difficult issues for them to negotiate. Um, but to return uh, to the question that we're sort of, the central question, um, even in terms of the fuzzy standards that the documents impose, that of a national and international reputation, you can start to see the barriers pretty clearly here, right? In that this woman is coming off of these committees, she's not doing the things that build that kind of uh, reputation, and she's not getting she's not going to move into administration. So this is final from her. She says, I'd love to go to more meetings and conferences, but until my daughter's out of high school, I can't. There was one I was going to go to last April, another one last year I canceled. Um, and I, I'm actually sort of trying to get her back to equilibrium at this point and not be talking, because you know, if you're a good interviewer, you don't want to leave your respondent in tears, really, as you go out the door. Um, and so I'm sort of headed out the door at this point, and she says, you know, I couldn't even do the research you're doing um, because of the travel. I've been declining things left and right. So she kept coming back to this over and over again as a theme in terms of the way that work family had affected her career. And I think she wasn't crying by the time I left. Um, but to the extent that building a reputation makes a difference, you can see how that difference matters right here. One of the things I've also seen in the interviews, and I'm, again, I want to document this, is that the function of the sabbatical for men and women, academic men and women, I think is very different. Um, academic men that I've interviewed often talk about where they traveled, you know, they went to Europe during their sabbatical and worked with whomever. Um, that's been less likely for the academic women that I've talked to, who more often, you know, who still wanted to produce the sabbatical papers or grants or whatever, um, but often organize it around work and family. So, you know, I'll be, it'll allow me to caretake my, you know, be with my family. Okay. So, let's see. So what I want to do, some of what I've already discussed here gets to issues of climate in departments and universities. And I've heard um, dozens of stories about hostile uh, department and university climates for women. But climates can be hostile in a variety of ways. Um, and certainly, um, straightforward harassment of women still happens, and I have lots of evidence of that, which I could share with you. Um, but I think there's a fairly wide consensus that that behavior is out of bounds, right? Whether universities do anything about it is something else, right? But ultimately, harassment is not supposed to be okay. But I want to argue for a somewhat broader way of viewing climate. Climates vary in the extent to which gender is made salient. In simple terms, the extent to which it's made sort of relevant and, and visible. So if you think about it this way, most of us go through our days with sort of an overt assumption of gender neutrality, right? We, we sort of don't assume that our gender is relevant. Um, if we're waiting in line for a sandwich, all of these examples have to do with food. Um, for example, um, it, does not, it doesn't occur to you that your gender is a relevant concern for the person who's making your sandwich or for the person in line in front of you, right? But if that person in line in front of you, who happens to be a man, turns around and says, ladies first, which might have happened in Mississippi, I think, um, right? Um, then suddenly your gender is relevant, right? And so too is his gender, right? All of a sudden in that moment, gender becomes relevant. Um, if I'm sitting in food again, the drive through line at McDonald's. Have you, ever, have you ever ordered a Happy Meal at McDonald's? I don't have children, so I don't do it very often, but the thing that they will ask you is, do you want a boy's toy or a girl's toy, right? So suddenly in the moment of ordering your burger and fries, your little wee burger and fries, um, gender becomes salient, right? Now these are silly examples, right? It might be if I'm hungry, I would be happy to get my sandwich first. Um, it's certainly the case that my niece, who is all Disney pink princess and six years old, would be happier with that pink toy than she would be with the Hot Wheels car. Um, but I use these examples to encourage a sort of broader way of thinking about climate. Um, gender as, so when we talk about gender as, 
gender salience, what I'm talking about is gender as a background characteristic that suddenly becomes foregrounded in interaction. So gender becomes salient to, that, to a moment, to a social context, right? Okay. So it's simply the case that in male-dominated work environments, which is true um, in the STEM disciplines, um, women's socially constructed gender is much more likely to come to the foreground um, than men is. So if you think of it this way, no matter how you stand on, on sort of where, what I'm talking about today, one thing is true, and sociologists never talk about truth with a big T, but I'm going to do that. Um, men in STEM disciplines will never, ever be the first man hired in their discipline. Um, with, some very, with some very odd examples, like vet medicine, which is now transforming very rapidly, um, men are never going to be in the minority in their departments, right? So ultimately, women's context is always going to be very, very different um, in their departments. Now, not all the ways that gender is made salient are problematic, but I want to give you a few quick examples of how gender becomes salient in the interviews that I've done. So certainly, I've collected um, a lot of, um, four brief examples, I've collected a lot of stories of straightforwardly hostile climates. I've interviewed a lot of women in science who came into the sciences in 1960-something and had lots of stories about sort of the bad old days in science. Um, and this is that great woman with the rules interpreted by morons. This is that woman again. Um, she says, um, I got a PhD out of med school and I went to the West Coast chemistry department. She said, which is kind of like being on a submarine. And because I'm a brilliant interviewer, I said, what does that mean? Um, I was the only woman. The sub I say a submarine because the lab I was in, the walls were covered with pictures of women from the newspaper. Lingerie ads, you know, the guys didn't go out and get porn, but they cut out these pictures from the newspaper and put them up on the wall. Um, I said, Wh what? They just wanted to look at pictures of women? And she said, yeah, they liked women. Um, and at class change, basically these, uh, you know, West Coast, wherever I was, was a warm place, and girls didn't wear a lot of clothes even then. So at class change, they would all run to the window to watch the women walk by. Um, and it was very open, it was very apparent, right? So this is a moment, or, or in fact a whole context, in which gender is made salient, right? The men are the scientists and the women are, the, are on the wall and they're outside the windows, right? They're being ogled, right? So you can, sort of, you can see it very clearly in this story. Now, I heard a lot of stories about the bad old days for women in science. Um, now certainly this woman survived her tour of duty in the submarine and if she didn't, I could not have interviewed her, right? I mean, that's an issue. There's sample selection bias going on here. I couldn't get to the women who left. Um, but it's important to recognize that even now, many women in STEM disciplines are very isolated. They're often the first or second in their respective departments. Um, this, this, I really liked this woman, so there are many quotes from her here. I'm sorry. I, but at any rate, this is a story about something that happened very recently in her department. So I, I use it here for comparison. She says, um, we had one junior woman, well, well, she would have been full by now, she, uh, she left a couple of years ago, and there was no reason, from our view, for her to leave. It gets better. Although I did have to talk to her about a very weird thing. Um, guys in our department, it was young guys, they didn't like how she dressed. So the secretary asked me to talk to her. I said, how did she dress? I mean, she's a scientist, for God's sakes. Well, somebody claimed they could tell she had a thong on. <coughs> Um, which is not a flip-flop, right? You got, you got that, right? Um, and, and I had this, I had to have this woman come in and I said, you have to come in and I have to talk to you because you have to know this is happening. I feel terrible saying this to you because I don't really care. Um, it's, it's your business, you ought, but you ought to know that there are people who are behaving this way. And so I told her and she was stunned, but I don't think that's why she left. Um, now, actually, it probably isn't, because if she left at that, she probably would have left long, long before that, right? But ultimately, she did leave, um, and it's got to be a little disconcerting to think the men in your department are, anyway. Um, but this is a moment of gender salience, in which her gender, which she's sort of walking down the hall, thinking is not particularly salient in her work environment, becomes dramatically and immediately salient, in this sense that, in fact, men are looking at her butt. Um, so, Ultimately, the accumulation of instances like this certainly leave, um, I think, women scientists with the impression that their accomplishments will not be taken particularly seriously as scientists. So this is one example that sort of makes this point in a really blatant way. There are other ways in which you can see gender salience in the interviews that I've done. One of them is in terms of attribution of success, and I hear this from women in departments a lot. This particular woman um, is a Hispanic faculty member um, and she says, um, you know, it's like Obama, it's like Sonia Sotomayor, you're a minority fa faculty member and that stands out. 
everything in your record is shredded. You're perceived as a person who everything was given to. You haven't earned anything. Um, I think I brought in at this point probably $15 million. Uh, I stopped counting. And it's like, well, she got it because she's, she said, come on, you don't get $15 million because you're a minority. You get it because you write a lot of grants and because you're persistent. Um, and I think that shows I have some value, but that's not how my resume is perceived. And I've heard this over and over and over again um, from women in departments who, I mean, it's, it's this sort of, you know, it's the, it's the double-edged thing, right? I mean, if you're not successful, then that confirms some stereotypes. But if you are successful, then ultimately it's not deserved because you got it because you were a woman. And it becomes sort of more complicated in, in, you know, when you have funding opportunities that are targeted for women or underrepresented groups, because if you take advantage of those, then somehow you confirm that stereotype. And I had one woman say, look, I don't give a damn. The money's green. Um, I'm happy to spend it whoever it comes from. But I, I heard this actually quite a lot. None of these quotes are really one-offs. There are many more examples in my data. Uh, another, a third example of, of gender salience in departments comes um, from the notion of emotional labor. And if you're a sociologist, um, this term is near and dear to you. This is work by Arlie Hochschild. Hochschild in 1983 published a book called The Managed Heart. And The Managed Heart was a study of flight attendants and bill collectors. And one of the things that Hochschild established in this study is that when women go to work, women are often required to do a lot of the labor of producing and managing emotions. So if you're a flight attendant, you have to bye-bye, right? You smile, you have to look happy. Um, and you also have to deal with very angry people, right? Ultimately, you have to, and in those days, it was basically business, you know, male business travelers who would get drunk and grope them or, you know, whatever it might be. But Hochschild argues, and, and I think it's true, that women are far more likely to be in men, far more likely than men to be in jobs that require emotional labor. And we don't think of faculty jobs all that often, or many people don't, you probably all do, um, as requiring emotional labor, but certainly um, that's the case. Um, this is a woman uh, in a math department who had a husband in the same department, which was very convenient for them because they served as like reference points. If it's not happening to my husband, it's not sexism. Um, so this woman says, when you teach mathematics, there are things my husband can get away with that I could never get away with just because students expect more from me. Um, I can never be rigid. It always has to be more putting on, sort of understanding. Um, and it does count against women if we don't do it. So it becomes part of your style of teaching. And she talked about, you know, basically if her husband's math class was failing, he could say, what kind of idiots are you? Why didn't you study? Why didn't you do the work? Right? And ultimately when students, you know, she couldn't pull off the same thing. Uh, well, here, let me help you. Let me nurture you. Right? Um, and she goes on to say, I, I love this part of her quote, she says, but sometimes I get a, annoyed and bored because I'm a scientist. So if we come out and say something like that, and somebody will write it on the evaluation. So I do what they expect, but if you think about it, it's not really fair. I love this because she really captures the distinction between the emotional labor that she's being asked to do and who a scientist is, right? I'm a scientist. I shouldn't have to do that, which gives you a sense of sort of the ideal type of what a scientist is, right? And then the last way I'll talk about gender salience is in terms of this notion of ideal types, which is, again, a, a concept I get from the sociological literature. Um, Joan, uh, Joan Williams has written about this. Joan Acker has written about it. This notion that in, in occupations, there is a sort of ideal worker, right? There's somebody, when you think about a professor, you have in your head as who a professor might be, right? Um, and it's not generally any of us in the room, right? Ultimately, professors are old guys with white hair and... Um, and patch jackets or, right? Um, yeah, and this is true in most occupations. So, uh, I mean, you can think about it when I teach um, this. I talk about firefighters. I, I, there's a great article in which a firefighting recruiter is saying, well, what we're really looking for in my profession is a man with a big S on his chest. Um, and I always think, but I wonder if you want him to be wearing tights as well. Um, <laughs> but, but suffice to say, there is a sense in every, every occupation, really, that there's an ideal worker norm. And that this starts to play even more of a role at the level of full professor. So this woman says, um, in my department, I think that with the idea of full, the idea of full professorship is associated with the idea of leader. Um, but leader could be leadership in your research or because, say, you're tall. Isn't it true that if you're the taller presidential king? Um, if, I think there's a common image in their mind of what a full professor should be in the department. And they attach some leadership quality, which is usually associated with a male figure. She goes on to say, I think that's why at the associate level you can be rational about it because they can see you have done the right work. When it becomes full, they feel the full professorship is a prize. It's not really needed. You can be associate professor all the rest of your life. So they see it as you deserve it for, for what reason? And then they point to this quality of leadership, of a leader. 
it's an ideal type, and it's associated more with a male. Um, and of course, this notion of leadership is often double-edged for women. So if you want them to then be leaders in their department, and they take on the same characteristics of men as leaders, then, then ultimately that can be equally or more problematic than if they're not in leadership roles at all. So this whole notion of leadership in the documents is, I think, a, a particularly problematic one. So those are the four sort of examples of salience I'll give you. So what can I say in terms of implications? Um, sociologists are often accused of being really good at identifying problems. Um, but we suck at identifying solutions. Read any book of sociology, the, like the last chapter, which is supposed to have solutions, and it will be like five pages long. We're, we're not very good at it. Um, so I plead guilty on that account, but I think uh, the analysis thus far has a few implications. Um, my analysis of, of tenure and promotion documents, I think, suggests that the, pr the criteria are often quite vague to the extent that they exist at all. Um, associate professors face these documents um, with a considerable amount of uncertainty about what it really takes to achieve promotion. And there are institutional ways to deal with that, right? Mentoring is one way to deal with it. Um, I've been on campuses that have instituted um, a mandatory five-year review. So after your, after your tenure, ultimately every five years, everybody puts their packet together, goes before a committee that says you're ready or you're not. Um, and, and I think some faculty would run screaming from that, others would embrace it. Um, but ultimately what it does is it creates a culture in which promotion is expected, right? So five years, you're going to put it together and ultimately. Um, and I think the fact that, these, that standards are unclear has much more of an impact on women than men. Um, I've interviewed a number of women in departments who, particularly um, in departments where they'd had sort of bruising or difficult tenure cases, uh, in which they said, well, you know, I think I'm ready, but but let me just, I just want to be sure. So I'm going to publish this next book, or I'm going to write this next grant, or I'm going to, and I interviewed a woman who was going to get a particular grant, and she didn't get it, and had never gone up for full, and five years later, ultimately was still associate. And so I think, you know, if you're unsure and you're isolated, then making it a slam dunk is one way that you can control it. But ultimately, that stretches out the process. Um, let's see, where are we? What did I say next? Um, Work-family balance issues remain very important for, for women faculty, regardless of rank. Um, I think institutions can solve some of that, I think, but there are other pieces of it institutions um, cannot solve. I've been on campuses um, that had no leave at all. Certainly my campus is one of those. I've been on other campuses that have uh, uh, sort of pseudo-leave policies. Um, I've been, many campuses now have stop-the-clock policies, and some of them are making those mandatory for faculty. Um, and I think... First of all, you have to have a culture that supports their use. Like people who use them have to believe it's not going to be held against them. But the second thing is that those those policies are hard for women in the sciences because you've got a, the the woman scientist or any scientist is really a small business owner. I mean, they're trying to keep their shop open. They're trying to pay people. They people depend on them to keep the lab open, right? And and you can't stop doing that ultimately. And so I think institutions have to think in far more complicated ways about how to help women in, in the STEM disciplines balance work and family. And I can't solve that problem because I'm a sociologist. Um, climate issues, uh, I think, are much harder to, to tackle. Um, mentoring is one way to deal with it. Um, they, they can help faculty cope with these unclear expectations and to cope with hostile department climates. And I have interviewed in some incredibly hostile department climates, places in which whole departments had been in mediation for months. Um, and some nice ones, like, but, but some, some pretty toxic climates. Um, so mentoring is one way to deal with that, but these programs really just help people deal with roadblocks. Like, so how do you get around this person who's in your way? How do you get around this policy that's in your way? Um, ideally, what we want to do and what ADVANCE is supposed to do is to help remove those roadblocks so that people don't need that assistance. So, so um, my sense, and I guess I'll go ahead and say this, that. My sense and sort of the, the loftiest thing I think that I can say about these interviews is that I think, this is the two universities, I think men and women, though they often work in the same departments, like next door to each other, don't work in the same departments. Um, men um, ultimately don't have to think about many of the things that women in their, their very same departments have to think about. Um, and I've seen this in the interviews in a variety of ways. The worst case um, was a woman I interviewed who had been treated horrifically poorly in her case for promotion to full. She had to go up again. Um, she was suicidal. She was in therapy. She was, um, I interviewed three men from the same department about their tenure and promotion policies, and they said, I think everything's transparent. It's clear. No one's ever had a problem. Um, so, so ultimately, my sense, and I have lots of other examples that sort of capture that, but my sense is there, there are often sort of two departments happening at the same time, and I think 
Um, it's not that I've interviewed sort of nasty, sexist men, because I haven't. Um, but what I have interviewed is men who just don't have to know. They're just sort of clueless, and it doesn't, and it doesn't benefit them in some ways not to be, right? Um, and so my sense is that that's at least part of what's happening. And this creates nightmares when you're trying to do things like evaluate a department, because who do you, you know, like whose view counts and whose view matters. And we just went through this in my department with a review of a chair. Um, so while these data right now are preliminary, I think, I think um, what I have holds some promise for understanding um, the barriers to promotion. And actually, I interviewed a whole group of faculty who I would call resistors to this whole notion that people should be full professors. And they were really interesting, but I'm not going to talk about them because I don't have time. Um, but I think they actually challenged my thinking a lot. And so my hope is that what will come out of this work is some institutional policies that will ultimately help make this process fairer and more equitable. So that's what I got. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Uh, and I'll answer anything, any question you might have. Or we can just order beer. Yeah. Uh, Debbie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't have. I didn't interview a lot of such women, um, but it is it is true for the women. I, I'm going to have to go back and take a look because I think I have about a dozen interviews from people in departments like art or music or English or um, the social sciences, and and so I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm going to have to go. You know, at this stage, I have 130 interviews, but if you've done qualitative work, you know I don't have 130 transcripts, um, and so it's a matter of. But I think that's interesting, and I'm and I ab I have absolutely have the data that would allow me to go back and look at it. Yeah. Yeah, but you'll never get them promoted. I mean, ultimately, they're not going to get credit for doing that work. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 No, and, and so see, I think hiring several senior women can transform a department. Relatively, so yeah. If you have, have right, 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 right. So, uh, but wouldn't it be possible to bring an associate in to be chair and go through positions where the applicants have to research science? Because have you? I, I I haven't talked to chairs who have a lot of research. So, I mean, I have so talked to some. Uh, yeah, no, I have talked to some, and they've they've mostly been uh, men in science departments who, when they became chairs, were able to negotiate a technician. So they were able to somehow keep their lab up and running. And in the sciences, that is a technician, right? You have a, people who ha have technicians who've been with them for years and who they trust to run their labs and organize the students. And so, yeah, I think it is possible. I think um, I, I have not seen many women as chairs who negotiated that kind of uh, arrangement. And they also don't get credit for it. I mean, you know, the thing is, I have, a, I have a friend who's sort of interested in biological models. And as a sociologist, I'm definitely not. But, but her argument is that academics are an unfit species. Like if we were sort of released in the wild, we wouldn't reproduce ourselves. And the reason is, the reason is because we don't, the academy doesn't reward the work of its reproduction. So if you think about the things that make the institution run, right? If you think about teaching students, if you think about doing service, if you think about, and, and in some ways, all land grants, have been pushed toward this R1 model, right? And they're moving farther and farther away from these values that were about serving the population and serving the students. And, um, and so we don't value those. We don't value service. We don't value teaching. What we do value is the stuff that makes people marketable, right? So in some ways, and in the process, what we're doing is, you know, biological diversity is good. You sort of want your tree to do this. Um, what we have in the academy is a tree that is a stick, right? I mean, we're producing one uh, kind of academic over and over and over again, right? Um, now, how you change that, I don't know. I had a conversation with an administrator in which I said, look, all right, I understand you want research overhead, right? We all need that. It's important. But what about in English? Why couldn't we just say in English? You could get credit for being an administrator, or you could get credit for teach more credit for teaching. You could get, 
no, we can't do that, right? Because we have to have this sort of one model that is about who an academic is. Um, and the fact that, you, that tenure and promotion goes through university committees sort of reinforces this model too. And, I, and you know, once, once tenure and promotion cases get out of departments, all kinds of interesting things can happen. But what happens is there's a regression toward the mean of this is the standard academic. And if you don't look like this, then we're not gonna promote you, so, well, yeah. Right. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. 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 No, I, I absolutely agree with you, right? I mean, women are socialized into an institution the same way that men are socialized into an institution. And, and the faculty women I've interviewed who sort of would describe themselves as feminists and, and the sciences, you don't, you don't run into a lot of them, but you do run into some. But, but they can always describe to me a series of events that happened to them somehow that made gender all of a sudden, oh, I, see, I get it now, right? I didn't see it before. And, and, and certainly men administrators, I think, when you talk about having a professional daughter or starting to understand some of the things that women faculty members go through. I actually interviewed a department head who, who looked like Santa Claus. He, was the, he had big white beard and big fuzzy hair, and he was the head of a department of biology, and he had eight junior women at one time. Um, and it wasn't that big of a department. And so for him, all of a sudden, work family <laughs> became really, really important. Um, and he started to, because all of these junior women were you know, at forming families. And so for him, these issues became important if he wanted to keep his department going, right? Because he, he was really sort of overloaded with junior women. You gotta solve those problems. And so it made it salient for him. But I think um, for the academic women, you know, women in the sciences are often very, you know, I interviewed one woman who said, my father raised me her father had raised her, and she said, he raised me to be a boy girl. He raised me to believe that if I just did follow the rules and did what they told me and did the right things, that ultimately good things would happen to me. And she said, and she had had a horrible experience, and she said, but ultimately, he didn't prepare me for the ugliness that comes with being a girl, because he didn't know. He just didn't know. Um, and I think so many of the, the of faculty in general I've interviewed, there's an event that sort of makes gender important to them and brings the problem to their attention. Um, but yes, I've interviewed women just as clueless. No, qu no question. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep, and I have. Oh no, no, and I have talked to women who've on, and you had one on this campus, and I know other campuses have had these workshops for women associate professors about being promoted to full. And I talk to women associates who say, "Wow, I didn't even know what a woman. Uh, there was not one in my college. There was not one in my department. I didn't know what a woman full professor looked like until I went to this um, workshop." I actually interviewed one woman who whose great goal in life is to be the first woman promoted to full professor in her college without a lawsuit. Um, there, there, there are two women full professors there, but both of them sued um, to, be, to be promoted. So as this woman looks out over her landscape at where the other women full professors are, she literally doesn't see them. I mean, they're just sort of not, I mean, and there are many departments in that college that have zero women um, and certainly no full women. And so you're right, I think, and uh, what we don't wanna do is put women on a million more committees because they're already on a million committees and they're already doing emotional labor that men are not doing. They're already, I mean, I, I interviewed a couple of women who um, counted the number of recommendation letters they had written like in the triple digits every semester. Um, and they knew that their male colleagues were not writing in the triple digit of 
you know, so, so women are drawn on for all of those kinds of tasks, I think. And universities have this very nominal level of uh, notion about diversity, which is if you have ovaries, then you're interested in women's issues. If you have, you know, if you're African American, you're interested in race, you know, um, without any sense that, in fact, we could maybe make everybody more interested and invested in these issues. And ultimately, that's what changes culture, right? So, oh yeah. What else? Okay, it was fun. Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. No, I, I think it is important to get women into, uh, into leadership or people who get gender regardless into leadership positions, but I would never advise anybody to do it um, as an associate professor. They're just, they're career killers. Um, and everybody I've interviewed who's been in those roles, um, and I've, I'm now to the point where I can look at a CV and tell you if somebody is sort of, be, you know, I don't want to use the language of stuck, but if somebody is sort of longer than usual at associate because they often are assistant department head or, or, whatever, or they've been focusing on, um, they teach a course called Engineering for Non-Majors um, or they, you know, like, so there are all these things that I can sort of look at CVs and go, oh yeah, I know, I know where you are in my sample. Um, and junior administration, junior, or chair, even worse, is one of those things that al almost always goes with that. Well, so. Right, that's exactly right. And so I think it's very important to continue the trajectory of how, how many years to, mm -hmm. to get tenure and then the last number of years when you're eligible, you mm -hmm. still need to really tell the people that you don't have mm -hmm. at the year mm -hmm. that you're eligible and not waiting for a formal invitation. Yeah. To get, and that to create more socialization too, mm -hmm. this trajectory is a team that you're going to follow mm -hmm. as opposed to, well, now that you're an associate, you can rest. <laughs> when I hear images, how often is there the implication that you're going to cut them off before they come back to care? Yeah. That you yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and I did ask that question in, in almost all the interviews I did. Um, and and in, in departments in which there is no review process in particular, right, because then you just sort of have to identify yourself. Um, I think it is true that, that um, wow, I interviewed some men who were just, just amazing self-promoters. I mean, they, they were clear that their research was important and that they deserved to go up and that they, identif and they identified themselves and actually they asked, right? Um, women, I think, were just less likely to recognize themselves as, as ready to go, right? And so ultimately somebody else would have to come to them, a colleague would say, you know, here's, you know, and, and often it was a male colleague who would say, your work looks, you know, good enough to go up, you should, put, you should move your file forward, right? Um, if you don't have a proactive chair, which is what that takes, right, then what has to happen is somebody's got to come to you and say, you look like you're ready. And because there are no standards, it's got to be somebody you trust to know that you are, in fact, um, Oh, you know, I think chairs, yeah, I think when chairs are, when chairs don't do this, they pretty much don't do it for anybody. Um, one of the things I've seen a lot of, and I don't say it here because it's sort of too specific, is I've been on, every campus I've been on has had major reorganization in the years before I've been there, right? So departments being combined with other departments or departments moved out of one college and put in another college or, um, and that always create, people always fall through the cracks in that situation because the policies are even more unclear because nobody knows what policy you're gonna be governed under. The new chair is, was not part of your faculty group so they don't know who's going. And that's particularly detrimental for women too because they are more likely to get sort of caught in that shuffle and caught between the cracks because nobody identifies them, not even their new colleagues generally can identify when they're ready. So, um, so, so yes, I think it's it, when sh when chairs aren't proactive, they don't do it for anybody. But ultimately, I think it has more of an impact on women who are less likely to put themselves forward. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah.
Yeah, well, are there women who should be going up who aren't because they're worried about it? Yes, I think that's absol absolutely true. I mean, and I think on most campuses there is a normative time, right? So I interviewed on one campus that had a norm of long-term associates, and you know, you could find them everywhere. Um, but on most campuses there's a normative expectation of time, and certainly I think people should go up. Um, the problem is, of course, when you, when you put yourself up, you're sort of, you know, that's scary, right? And, and in some ways, I mean, when I, I, I won't tell you my long story, but I, I'm the I'm the only woman full professor in my department and the second woman full professor in the history of sociology at Kansas State University. Um, and when I came up, one of the things that, that my male colleagues were unhappy about is that I did not come and ask them if, I, if they thought I was ready to go up. Um, and so there is a certain prerogative that you're stepping on, right, if you, if you put yourself forward, right, which is to say, you know, I don't have to ask you and I can judge whether I'm ready. And then, of course, you need, the thing about committees for promotion to full, is that they're older, whiter, and maler than the committees for tenure, because in most departments, it's the committee of the polls who votes on, um, and, it's, and they're smaller, right? So there's a smaller number of people. So you can annoy 50% of that group. <laughs> pretty, pretty. So yes is the answer to your question, but I think when women do that, the connotations of it often uh, can, be, can be difficult or problematic. So I was promoted, but they were annoyed that I didn't ask them. So, um, so yeah. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there's a lot of stuff that works on various advanced campuses. And if you're, I mean, and all of this stuff is, I mean, you can go to the web and find all of these models out there. Um, I mean, I think um, advanced has, has attacked this problem at a number of levels, and I, I, which reminds me to get back to your question. Um, some advanced grants have, for example, focused on nominating women for prestigious awards in their discipline. So they've created structures to make that happen. Because what they find is that men are nominated by the men who they work with and who know them and you know, are connected to those networks and women often get sort of passed over in those things. And I was actually in an engineering college in which I was sort of walking down the hall and I saw their award winners for the year up and it was you know, research award one, research award two, and there was you know, all men. I get to the advising award and, there, you know, and, and there's you know, woman professor of chemical engineering or whatever that might be. Um, so it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. If the problem you're trying to solve is visibility, that's one issue. If the problem you're trying to solve is networks, a variety of advanced grants have focused on connecting women to networks outside of their institutions or outside of their departments. Um, there are a lot of advanced grants that focus on hiring and getting the pools more diverse and have assigned equity advisors to each you know, department who's searching. A lot of advanced grants have focused on training for search, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there, uh, it's not a, I, I don't want to duck the question, but in some ways there are so many advanced strategies at this point, four rounds in, that it really depends on what kind of problem you want to solve. And every advanced, yeah. Well, what do you want to transform, Tori? <laughs> Yeah. 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 Right. 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 I, I, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, I, I mean, I really do. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. I mean, I, and I, and it also depends on your metrics of success. So much of the evaluation of advance is focused on: Do you now have more women among the faculty, right? And and in fact, many institutions do. So North Dakota State, which has an advance grant, is going to double the number of women full professors on its campus this year. It's pretty astonishing. Of course, they only started out with nine, um, right? But, but those have been the kinds of, but as, as everybody has pointed out, that's not enough by itself to change the culture. So North Dakota State, for example, is focused on getting more women in leadership positions, so providing leadership training and giving, them, giving women that opportunity. I mean, I think it, it really it depends on sort of how you want to count success and how you want to, um, and, and sort of the problem you want to solve. I mean, as a sociologist who studies gendered organizations, I'm not sure ultimately that we're going to transform universities from, from a sort of, you know, 
masculinized institution. Um, can we make departments better? Yes, I think absolutely we can. And I think some, I mean, some of the strategies that we've been talking about are ways to do that, but I can't fix it, Tori, I'm a sociologist. I don't, I mean, um, there are some meta-analyses right now going on of advance. And, and I know because Kansas State's been asked to participate. So it should be interesting to see what comes out of those. Um, University of Michigan claims it did it that, it, that it solved the problem. And what's happening with University of Michigan is that they're now putting quarter million dollars a year of their own money into advance. And so they've been able to keep it running basically at the same level they had it running when they had the grant money. Of course, my institution, you know, we didn't we don't have a quarter of a million dollars to sort of keep advance running. So, so the question is, how do you keep it transformed after the money is gone? Which I think that which I think we don't know the answer to. That's the thing that that is much much more fuzzy to me. Um, but I think while you have three and a half million dollars at a university, department heads and administrators like that money, right? They're happy to work with you. Um, it's what happens after the money goes, I think. And so, I don't know. I can't fix it. I give up. <laughs> I just interviewed 130 people, man. I don't know. I don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yes, you should. Sure. You should. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. They're going this way. Tori? Look, I can control this if I have to. Tori? <laughs> yes? It, introduce you. You tell me then. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll say something about the resistors if you want. I, I, I'm, I think they're very interesting. Go ahead. Uh, Debbie. Be because you have a title that has associate in yes, it. Yes. Yes. Yep. I did that as an associate yep. Colleges of nursing are that one of those places. Yep. Yeah. 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 I w I'm interested too. <laughs> yeah. In the back. You're one of the 58. You're one of the 58. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Huh? Both both of whom are full? Huh? Ah, interesting. All right, I'll I'll have to look at my numbers. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, okay. All right, well, here's, let me say this about the resistors, who I think were fascinating, and I'll be quick. Um, part of, I, I interviewed a bunch of people who said, you know what, this is your game, it's not really mine, I'm not driven by this promotion of full. And one of the reasons that they gave, so it's, this is going against your notion we need to get people up as quickly as possible, but, but one of the critiques that they developed was, this is really about an academic speed up, right? So we had people on a clock for six years, and it was ticking in their ears, and it said, if you don't do this, we're gonna take your job, right? And there was a time in which once people got tenure, they felt some freedom. They felt like, okay, I can pursue this new direction in my research, 
or I can, you know, make those cookies for my daughter's class that I couldn't make, you know, while I was on the tenure clock, or I can, you know, or I can do this thing that I couldn't do when I was an assistant, because that's the whole point of tenure, right? It was supposed to give you some freedom, right? So now what we've done, the argument goes, is that we've just reimposed the clock, right? So we've said to people, all right, here it is. You thought you were through with it. We're going to put it back in your ear for six years, and you're going to get to full as quickly as you possibly can. Um, and, and on one campus, somebody really sort of invoked the notion of surveillance, right? So all of a sudden, what you do is you just sort of resubmit yourself to the same kind of surveillance you were under for six years all over again, right? Um, and that's fascinating to me, really, because this really is about an academic speed up in some ways. We're now paying attention to this promotion to full and saying, and you have to get there as quickly as you can. And ultimately, what that does is, of course, it gives the institution more control, right? So now you have to do what the institution says you want to they want you to do. So you, you may not agree with the resistors, and I myself went through as quickly as I could, and I bought into the game entirely. Um, but, but it is interesting that there is, that there is this sort of notion that, look, this is, not, this, is, this is your game. It's not my game. Um, and ultimately, I want more control over my life, and I want more control over my time, which now people say after full. So now they're saying that oh, now that I'm a full professor, I can do this. I can do this research project, or I can get this grant to focus on teaching, or I can. So it's the place at which people feel that freedom has ratcheted up six years in the process, I think. Um, so they've been, those have been really interesting interviews, for me at least, because they sort, of they sort of undo the whole premise, right, that people are stuck, right, and we need to push them along. So wasn't, they've been interesting to me. So you're not stuck. It's okay. Maybe you're a resistor. Could be, right? Right. Um, okay. Well, thanks so much. I enjoyed it. It was nice meeting everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, sure.